I should really briefly oh. just um, say like I, who I am. I'm nobody. Um, I used to run a film night for a chapter called Noise of Us, which was focusing on music documentaries, and we'd screen them at Bogies and Full Moon and things like that. <coughs> so when this came up, um, the chapter knows that I'm a, a, a complete obsessive where it comes to particularly rock, punk, and metal documentaries, and so they asked me if I'd come in and do this, so it's a real pleasure to be here. So um, I don't need to introduce these guys on stage. You know exactly who they are, but I will introduce them because that's part of what I'm supposed to do. So we've got Wes over here who made mm. the film. <laughs> We have Bryn and Paul here who made the music. <laughs> and this is Rick, who you also know from the film, who had the dubious pleasure of trying to manage that shambles at some point in their, uh, in their career. Oh boy, so. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Absolutely. So, I mean, just to kick off, I mean, I, I wanted to ask Wes a question. I mean, just to say, I mean, I've got a couple of questions here, but... Um, which you know, I'm, I'm going to throw out there, but there's 180 of you, and I'm sure you've all got questions, and so <coughs> I'll ask a couple, and then I'm going to throw it out to you lot. So have a think about what you might want to ask this, uh, this, this bunch here. But Wes, one of the things I wanted to ask you, I wanted to congratulate you on the film. It's fantastic, really. I've yeah, seen it a couple, couple of times now. It's a really, really good thank documentary. You. Um, you've done two impossible tasks there, I would say. One, you've managed to make a documentary about a bunch of people who clearly don't want to be in the same room as each other. <laughs> You've also managed to make a documentary about a time and a place and a t form of music without wheeling out Henry Rollins to give a sound bite, which seems completely <laughs> impossible in this day and age. Yeah, and so, yeah. fair play to you for that. <laughs> but something that I felt um, personally about the film is, I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of the band, I'm a fan of the period. And actually, um, Vanian makes reference to this, I think, at one point, about um, where the band uh, kind of really sit commercially. And... Um, I think something that I got from this is the damned were really important. And actually, when we look back on that time, constantly people talk about the clash, constantly people talk about the pistols. And um, <coughs> it feels like there's a potential that this film is maybe an important uh, readdressing of that balance. Because it's, I think you look back on any movement and it's genuinely the pioneers of a movement. The people that truly kick the doors open are the people that don't often really get that kind of commercial success at the end of it. And I personally got the feeling that maybe there was something of that going on in this film. Uh, something Rat says that you know the pioneers get the arrows and the the settlers get the gold. You know I, that was one of his sound bites that I tried to shoehorn in the film, but I couldn't really. You know, I even thought about playing with that in the title. You know, but it just seemed too cliched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I think that really yeah. comes across. I think it's, it's, you genuinely get that feeling from it. Yeah. It's it's um, <coughs> well, yeah. I kind of hope that it, it does become this important moment, I guess, in the Dam's career, which you so uh, adequately capture through the film. Um, yeah. Bryn, there's a moment in the film there where I'd say it's the most emotional moment in the film, really, where Rat's talking about that time. I believe you were the bass player at this moment when um, the uh, kind of, you know, that moment goes, we, we had everything. We walked into the studio, we had the amps, we had this. It's funny how you should pick that up. Because what Paul and I have just been surviving, I feel in invincible now. It doesn't matter. I think that's what being part of the dam was, being invincible. Who cares? And I think there was, uh, there was uh, it's not Wes's fault or anything, but there was a massive gap, I suppose, between Paul's career and my career in the, in the group. I mean, I was probably there for longer than anyone else, really. At one point, I thought it was you, and then the next point, I'm still there. <laughs> and, and then when Rat turned around, and got, he got emotional. And because of what I'd just been through, I had to go to the toilet. Right. My eyes were streaming up. I said, where's my medication? Where's my Moxie's? What's the name of the keyboard player again? Because my drugs are exactly the same. Moxie something. Moxie <laughs> 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 <Yeah, laughs> <yeah. laughs> Yeah, I need a bit of him. And, I, and I, I felt, even though Rat and I had fallen out many a time, I knew he had a heart of gold, really, but he wouldn't show it. He wouldn't show it. He was just too tough. And I was just this young kid who just wanted to go somewhere, get drunk, get, you know, do all the things what you, you want to do, you know? I saw Paul doing it. I thought, why can't I? And uh, I just got really emotional. I just thought, wow. I know this thing deep down inside Rat, even though I've said some bad things about him sometimes, and I'm sure he says some bad things about me. Who cares? <laughs> but it's funny how you picked that up. Uh, Did you see me sobbing? I didn't see you sobbing, no, no, well, no. I'm, I'm glad to say. But, um, sad, yeah. but I, I mean, that must have been a really strange moment. That, it was, um, it was very, very strange. Why it was all coming to that sort of headway. Record company sort of arguing amongst each other. They sat this guy called Elliot when I was with him. He was MCA, he was an American guy. And the uh, first time I ever met him, he, I was told that he didn't like people who smoked and drank, but I fell over him, spilt feet over him, shook it down, and burnt it down with a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> he, he loved me, he said, boy, I love these guys. That's if he's scared. <laughs> 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 
But uh, it was it was sad because we just thought, where are we going? We're going nowhere. Rotten companies are arguing. They can't make decisions. No one had the balls to say anything. So we just left to rot. <laughs> <laughs> On that. Yeah. Um, Paul, you you were in the band a couple of times over the uh, over the life, and and again, there's a moment in there which I found really interesting. Um, it was a '96 gig um, where there's that the footage. It's a Cardiff gig, and Banian doesn't turn up for it. Um, maybe that's kind of like one of those truly damaging moments that you don't want to talk about ever again. But I was really interested in it being in the film, and I just wondered, kind of, um, what that was like for you. I mean, it's I mean, I know you're not from. Cardiff, but you've lived here a really long time in the area. Like it's a hometown well, gig. Well, I'm an honorary like Cardiff. Yeah, exactly. 35 years. Exactly. You know? yeah. yeah. And so you know, hometown gig, something like that happens. Um, um, what was that like? Well, I wasn't best chuffed <laughs> <laughs> because you know my mate put a gig on, and uh, it was the night before the town and country, I think, which is the last gig I did with the damned. <clears throat> in um, well, the last two gig, gig I did about five years because my ears were knackered as well. Um, but it was disappointing because, um, you know, people have paid good money to come and see the band. Um, and it was billed as the Dems, and the singer decided he wouldn't show up for whatever reason. You know, it's happened many times since, as Captain Reddish is telling me. <laughs> and I'm sure it happened again. Um, but, you know, it's a funny old group. And, uh, but we went on and we did the best we could. I don't think anybody's mind their money back. Um, we all got happily drunk and that was it. But uh, it was a bit strange because the next night was the was the scene C. Um, and they turned up, I think, you know, five minutes before the gig. And there was sort of half a bottle of port and it wasn't sort of, oh, sorry about not turning up yesterday. It was kind of like as if nothing had happened. And I think it's quite important that everybody in the band actually turned up to the gig. <laughs> you know, I don't know about anybody else, but it's yeah. kind of like, that's what you pay your money to see. So it's kind of respectable work ethic. But you actually know, that's, turn up for that's work. the damn. So yeah, <laughs> what can I say? Yeah, I mean, Paul, is that your friend who's uh, reading the note that you guys wrote? That was my mate Craig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah did fine. you already know that you were going to leave the band before the town and country game? No, no idea. Was it because of Vania not showing up? No, it wasn't because of that. It was um, because uh, it had become an unpleasant kind of perpetual reunion, I think it was a sort of third or fourth worldwide reunion thing. And um, when it started off, and we did it with Brian doing the first set and me coming and doing the Black Album set and Strawberries, it was really good fun. But because of that scene in there where um, Captain uh, erroneously credited New Rose to Guns N' Roses, <laughs> which is a bit of a laugh, isn't it? Um, obviously not for Brian. No. Because he, he flew the biggest fucking wobbly I've ever <laughs> kind of seen, you know. I was downstairs in the dressing room, sort of, and I heard it all going up. He came down, and it was like, you know, carnage. And then, of course, he um, disappeared the next day, so we, we carried on. But the, the reunions sort of happen on a fairly regular basis every, I don't know, year, couple of years. Um, and each reunion, we all got a bit more fractured, you know. Uh, we all kind of we just didn't mix together and it became kind of like you know you join a band because you're mates you want to have fun and you want to make you know good music and it, it, it that wasn't what it was about it was about let's kind of squeeze a few more bucks out of it um and so that being kind of building up and i thought you know i was doing stuff with captain um his solo stuff and i was doing stuff with eddie hot back again which was loads more fun there was not like real raw rock and roll rather than just sort of trot trotting it out. Um, oh, yeah, and then um, then the Cardi thing happened, and the next night up the TNC, I, I, I got a, a, a mug in the, uh, full on me in the mush. And I sort of went off off, off the third song, whatever, and I thought, get, you know, wiped off and go back on, and, and the crew looked at it, and it had gone right through my lip, and it seemed to be stitched up. I thought, do I really want to still be doing this at like 45, you know, with a sink that doesn't turn up, with a band that don't want to be together, you know, being possibly scarred for life, fuck it. And that, that kind of, you know, you just have, everybody's got their kind of breaking point. So, um, but you know, I've played with them since, and, and it, the future's the future. Isn't those, it? those kind of incidents, I mean, looking at the film, they, they seem to be rife throughout the band's career. <coughs> I mean, this is something I'd maybe uh, like to bring you in at this point, Rick, where 
Um, you obviously kind of had uh, very close contact and, and uh, responsibility really for the band at a point in their yeah. career, and so you'd have, you'd have been part of these uh, creative tensions, should we call them, that existed and physical fights and what have you. I'm not saying you were in the fights, but you know you were around this kind of stuff. And part of the, partly, I'm kind of wondering, you know, all the all the greatest bands. Um, tend to have these uh, very fiery, creative relationships with each other, and and for the for the kind of um, uh, <coughs> sort of classic punk experience that we've kind of been talked uh, told about there. I wonder if there were you could see real positives coming out of those fiery relationships and the and the fist fights to a point. I I I think I'm really lucky in that in that I was sort of involved with them in a, in in the sort of first period of regeneration. So it's sort of like after the first al after the first two albums and the whole thing split up, and um, uh, my my first thing was sort of was because I'd, I'd 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 worked for Stiff for a while and there's there's a whole story about that. I, I ended up getting fired from Stiff and I started my own PR company, and then I started working with Captain and he put a band together called King. Um, and um, the sort of the, the whole first reunion, if you like, the doom period that turned into the damned, into Machine Gun Etica, was the period I looked after them. So it was it was the first time getting them on top of the pops. It was the, you know the sort of the <coughs> love song. You know, put out the dodgy demo originally that turned into their first sort of proper hit record and so on. So my memories are, are sort of, are, are quite rose-tinted in a way, until I remember all the times that my bed was turned over, that my, like, my, and actually my life was fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> but you need uh, the shoes changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, several times a night in the swimming pool, yeah. Um, they, you know, it was that period which in the film, like, where's, or somebody says, that like, it's sort of the most out of control time. Rat said that. Yeah, and, and, that and they were, and he was the worst of the lot. You know, he was like, he was, he was sort of, you know, on a, um, on, on a bottle of whiskey before breakfast, basically. So it was actually, it was also, it was the first time that I ever went to America was with them. And, and there's quite a nice story around that. It was sort of, I was really scared of flying, so I was sort of taking <laughs> pills um, to get over flying. And we had to go from like the East Coast to the West Coast and fly. Um, and I was sort of taking my pills and everything. And I felt really good when we landed in San Francisco. And we'd done all right on the East Coast, a bit of money in pocket. So um, uh, we got three limos at the airport to take us to this really shitty travel lodgy type hotel. Um, and that was a point where uh, we didn't get paid at a gig because um, Captain was pissing on the audience and, and, and various things like that. And there were two shows that night. And he ended up in hospital. Because You're talking about the footage that, that yeah, we saw. Yeah. There were two shows in San Francisco that night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the audience sort of, you know, they uh, uh, basically captain got a, got a sort of chair in his head or something um, and had to get into hospital. And that was all the money. You know, we had no credit cards or anything. It was just like that was it. That was the money gone. So we didn't even have enough money to pay our way out of the hotel that night. So we turned up at this shitty hotel in three limousines to get out of the hotel, we had to go down the fire escape, carrying all the guitars and stuff, and get the bus to the airport to get us to the next gig. But I still have like great memories <laughs> of, of those times. <laughs> it's like you know, they, 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 there's something, and I, I guess all of us here on the stage have had some, you know, been it part of it at some point of time. There's sort of for whatever the shit. And there was loads of shit. There's a real bit of love in our hearts. Certainly, in my heart, as an amazing man, I love to them. I, I love them to death. Well, you never knew what was going to happen from from day to day, or hour to hour, or minute to minute. I mean, that, that yeah. was the, the fantastic thing about that group. Um, 
you know, I think in groups before and after, but the, the dam was the kind of the, the pinnacle, I think, of this probably agree with me. You know, I mean, it was just extraordinary um, education. Yeah. You know, I learned more from the first three years in the dam than I did in the previous, you know, 19. Um, from the way that people interacted and the characters and the sort of stuff that happened and just what you could get away with. And yeah. the total disregard for, you know, any kind of laws or etiquette. You know, you, you just did what you, you felt you could get away with and you got away with it. Yeah. I don't think many, many bands, many people could get away with that. And that's, you know. I think they were terrified. Yeah, so was I. Yeah. <laughs> I, I certainly was. I, I think they were terrified. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we look at Dave uh, in the film and um, he comes across as such a typical old gentleman sort of chap, you know. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if I've got some sort of magic here, but we're both born the 12th of October. His wife was born the 2nd of November. My second wife was born the 2nd of November. My mum was born the 2nd of November. It's all weird. <laughs> some weird things happened. And I remember we were in the Paradiso in Amsterdam playing, and of course the Gestapo had been running it for one point. And um, we'd been asked to go out for something to eat. And um, for some reason, Rat decided to go somewhere else to do a, a sound check or something, and um, we'd gone to this um, restaurant to have something to eat, and I uh, had a margarita, and I found some um, some metal in it. So uh, Roman some said, some metal in my margarita. So Roman said, this is a nice complaint if I was you, so I did, politely, and uh, we just had margarita, had the margarita. Now Dave all of a sudden turned in to Jekyll and Hyde. It was brilliant, <laughs> absolutely what fantastic. Sounds good. Oh, oh, yeah, and there's bits of green coming everywhere. And um, all of a sudden, there's this tour manager looking for us. And we're in this little restaurant right next to the hotel, but no one knows where we are. We've been here for about an hour. I kept getting soused. Oh, I totally forgot what to do. It didn't matter. It was irrelevant. And then all of a sudden, he found us. He said, Christ, where have you been? I said, well, we're next door. So anyway, he took us down to the show. And as soon as he took us to the show that we came, Vainian went stamping through this door. Doors blew open. Scabies just looked straight away because he knows what Dave's like. He said, I want what they got. <laughs> and we started doing the show, and I think after the third song, I turned around, Roman wasn't there, he was at the bar. So then I went to the bar. The whole roadies played the whole show while we were at the bar getting drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what? It was probably the best audience we'd had for about three days because they'd been really bad for the last one. Well, the best gig as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that show that Rick mentioned, that's in the film, a lot of the footage from that is in the film. Um, that San Francisco show, you can see it all on YouTube, and uh, Sensible gets hit by the chair yeah. that you see the aftermath. And I don't know if anybody knows this, I know Catherine doesn't know it, but Rat is the one who hit him with the chair. <laughs> and, and he told me recently, he's like, he doesn't know that, and he loved that he didn't know it still to this day. You know? Brilliant. Yeah. wonder how much longer he'll get, get away with that one for. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to I open it up to you guys, if that's all right. There, yeah. there is a microphone here. Um, if you've got a question, please put your hand up, and and Claire will run to you with the mic. So, um, Claire, Claire, sorry, this 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 gent here first. Oh, there we are. One, two. <laughs> um, what happened for the Naz Nomad and the Nightmares? How did that come about? Is a psychedelic sort of thing? Because that also like strawberries, what mentioned in the film, like where was the influence to bring back a load of psychedelic classics well, and put it on album? I know that the rest of the boys in the dam, by myself, really, were right into all this old, um, <coughs> very unknown small-time bands in America, you know, psychedelic stuff. I, I, I didn't know Nuggets. That. Yeah, no, that sort of stuff. I mean, I, all I was interested in is trying to get someone to get drunk. And uh, I remember there was this massive sort of like, guess who this is then, Captain, you know? And they would always play this little game, who, who's got the secret band that no one knows about? And that's how I think Naz Norman and Nightmare started. And then, uh, what, what was his name from? Shit, Roger, Roger Armstrong. Roger Armstrong, yeah. He um, said that somebody was offered us a couple of grand, I think, to uh, <coughs> make an album. So we did. And that's how, that's how it sort of came about, really. Did you ever do any live shows? Did yeah, we did many live shows. I remember we were on the Greyhound and places like that. But the maddest thing was, wherever we played, it was always we had to play Smash It Up. You know? <laughs> wherever we went, we had to play Smash It Up. <coughs> Perhaps we should just smash something up and not play the song, I don't know. <laughs> Well, thank you, but I never thought that way. <laughs> Other questions? A uh, question for 
Paul and Bryn. Bear in mind, it's the uh, 40th anniversary of the Dan playing the Albert Hall next Who's year. Who's that? Oh, there you are. All right, Paul. Sean. Um, bear in mind, it's the 40th anniversary next year at the Albert Hall. How many former Dan members who aren't in the current lineup will be it's gonna be in attending, yeah. performing? <laughs> <coughs> Don't ask me. No, nobody knows. Ask, ask, ask who's in the band now. Mm -hmm. No, no idea. So there's just been no, I mean, there's there's no contact about any, it. Anything? Yet. Yeah, I speak to Captain. But yeah. I mean, about that in particular, there's been no um, talk of. I saw it on Facebook the other day. Right. Okay. As you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing changes then, Paul. <laughs> you know, I think once you get an illness like me and Brenda had, you know, it, it kind of puts everything into perspective, yeah. and you just think, I just want to fucking live. Everything else is bollocks, you know. And I'll, I'll pay to, you know, three men and a dog. I'll pay one man and a dog. I'll pay to fucking dog. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's, I've, I've got me Rick and back a bass and I just love playing it with You've got loads of them. whoever. <laughs> so, um, um, I mean, who knows? Uh, yeah. You know, it's the damned. Anything could happen, couldn't it? Well, that's fair enough. I think I speak for all of us. It's great to see both of you looking so well. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe that's one that wears the answer in the bar afterwards. Yeah, I, don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. no, I, mean, no, I, mean, I, don't, I don't consider either one of them to be egotistical. Tricks. I mean, I, I think we can do all of them. You know, um, to a lesser degree as anyone, because you know, I don't know that anyone really has friends. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really know. Creatures. What say that again? He's trying, to back, he's trying to backtrack now. I, yeah, I guess, I, guess yeah. I guess everyone here can have a pop at the answer in that question, can't they? Yeah. <laughs> if they Maybe want to. I, to I, think, I, think <laughs> they've I think they've swapped roles over the years, and I think, I think both of them in their hearts are really nice people. I really do. But both of them have had real serious problems during their lives uh, for whatever reason. You know, I mean, Captain's had very serious illnesses. Um, Rat has had had huge problems in his life, and they've both, you know, and they've sort of, you know, sometimes one's been the good guy, sometimes the other guy's been the good guy, <coughs> but you know, they've 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 kept going there themselves, and and like, you know, it would I think everyone here would love to see them being able to work together again, and maybe one day they will, but. Um, there's something rotten in the house, which which Wes gets to a little bit. Um, you know, you certainly get like sort of rat side of it, I guess. Um, but there's no real response there yet, is there? I you think know, as, as yeah, in terms of like how much that hurt him or didn't hurt him or whatever it is, it's a it's a weird thing, you know. It's interesting, uh, I think, early, quite early on in the film, you kind of tantalisingly set up that question where you say, you know, what would have to happen, <coughs> you know, for you guys to start talking again? Would it just be a case of picking up the phone? I, I mean, I forget exactly the quote. And, yeah. and it's like, oh, wow, right, yeah, is, is, th is this where the arc of this film is going to go? And then it really doesn't. And so yeah. yeah, I mean, the thing is, uh, the thing that was weird about um, Sensible and, and Scabies was that, you know, they both said really evil shit about each other to me. <laughs> Right. some reason like the, the opportunity to really 
you know, spew some hatred. I wouldn't care if it was on, but he never took it, you know? And, uh, uh, and it's sensible the whole time was petrified that rap was going to be 20 times worse than he was. And, um, uh, and, and I kept telling him, Cap, I mean, you've probably been nastier than he has on camera, you know? And, uh, like, I wish they hadn't held back, but I couldn't force them, <coughs> you know, to, to say, and some of it's too personal. You know, some of the things that they've said is too personal. It doesn't need to be disseminated. And, um, yeah, it, you know, it's weird. It's like the other day I had a beer with Scabies, and he uh, um, he said, Captain was my best friend, best mate, is what he said. Mm. And uh, for some, I don't know if there is so much for Captain, but I think there is some just weirdness that's resulted in just the passage of time. You know how that happens between people? Mm. And, and uh, you know, uh, Paul probably has a lot to say about this. You're as well. But... Uh, I mean, I think a lot of the weirdness between those two is because they haven't talked, and there's just been stuff in magazines, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, he said, he said, and um, uh, I, I, you know, Scabies is convinced that it would take a half an hour or an hour before that you know, they'd be friends again. And he said that actually even happened in 2007 when they got together to discuss a reunion tour that never happened. You know, interesting. Yeah, <coughs> that's Ma his side of it. Yeah, yeah. You know. Maybe it's unrequited love. Maybe. <laughs> 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 I thought uh, something else I thought the film did well though is that it clearly spelled out the tensions that existed, um, and maybe the stuff never actually got captured on film, like the kind of real dirt. But um, it you didn't no, you didn't you me, didn't just uh, when everything was packed up. Yeah, I see. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I yeah. thought it was good that the film yeah. didn't just needlessly have people stabbing each other in the back. And I think that would have been great to have. It. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first I walked into the bar. Don't mention that song. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, the, this, the song that yeah. Captain yeah. hates. Exactly. I walked into the bar earlier and met these two fine gentlemen for the first time who, when, I found, when they found out I'd seen the film, first thing Bryn said was, have I got to apologise to him for anything? I can't remember what I said. I'm sure I was slagging him <laughs> off at some point. <laughs> but there we are. So I thought I'd met you in jail or something. Oh, that was it, yeah. That was <laughs> Um, up the back there. Uh, for Bryn, uh, what was it like going from the missing men to the damned? <coughs> a shock. <coughs> it's that, at least. I don't, I, I don't know. It was a, I was so happy when a friend of mine who used to work for Rough Trade had turned me on to the Ramones and the damned. It was exactly the same time. It was just spot on. And I was into things like Zeppelin or Bowie or or ground dog, I was into all sorts of things, you know, stones, and I, I, I didn't go a massive field. Got right into reggae in a big way at one point, but then I hear this this this, this uh, single, Is She Really Gone Out With Him? And I hear those drums, and it's like, that is insane, mad. And then when I hear the, the Ramones album, and sort of speed and how quick it was, I thought, I can do this, I can do this. I remember being really ill, and uh, just having this guitar for a good friend of mine up there, Practicing, practicing, practicing all the time. Just think, I gotta do this. And it's just really funny how you just go through the motions of thinking, if I want to do something, I'm gonna do it. And I don't know how it happened, but it did. It all turned out wrong. <coughs> all right. It all went back fighting and what have you. But uh, oh well, I had an experience. But it was fantastic. But from the missing men to the damned, it was very odd, very odd. I mean, I was I was conscious of what I was gonna be playing. Paul's a great bass player. That thing to myself. Oh God. I want to play that there. I just said to him, no, I'll get, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get you my <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> uh, I, I was like freaked right out, thinking, oh God, everyone loves Paul. He's disappeared. I didn't know why he disappeared <coughs> at the time. I got to know Paul because of Roman and met him at a hot gossip gig, wasn't it? Met him on the gig. Hot gossip gig, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he had and, and he had 1981. Yeah, yeah, I was at the phone. Don't yeah. know why. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for some no. reason, he just, he, he, he left. And I had, three, I had three days to learn the whole set. I remember Andy with a record player just put, no, I've got to put it back again. No, for Christ's sake, the records must have been warm right off. Put it, oh, no, I missed that bit. And I remember going through it and through it and through it, thinking, oh, God, I hope I get this right. And then when I got to Rat's house, the phone rang. It was one of my favourites, uh, um, Sexy from Roots, chatting to me. And I was, I was in, in awe of all these people. Do you know what I mean? I was just a young kid from Barry. Didn't know nothing, you know? And uh, I remember I had to do this tour. And it was in St. Albans, the very first gig, and then we had a day off, and it broke everything up. I was ready to go, do you know what I mean? <coughs> I remember Rat making me wear a bin bag, 
and he read something on it, so stupid. I sweated like a pig. I mean, I, I think I went from eleven stone to nine stone in about a week. <laughs> and, I, and I remember things being sort of knocking on the edge somewhere. And I just thought, <coughs> what's that? And they uh, said, oh, do you want one? I'm not going to mention anything. And uh, uh, I said, I don't do things like that before. He said, but well, you're not in the group. And it's really weird because many years later, fucking rat wouldn't fucking let me drink, wouldn't let me fucking take this, wouldn't let me do that. And I remember. Um, Sensible saying, well, if he doesn't drink and doesn't do that, I'm not going on stage. We had to do this sort of two shows in one night, like a matinee thing. It was chaos. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. And you know, I hadn't played for 19 years. My good friend up there, Andy, said to me, you should start playing again. And I really couldn't remember how to play. I couldn't remember playing one note. I could play my acoustic guitar, I was crap at playing chords. But I couldn't play my bass, and it was my passion. And uh, he said, you should start playing the game. And I said, well, you should do some Ramon songs, only three, no, you know, three chords here and there. And, uh, oh, that, it works. <laughs> was, was I quiet? Shall we repeat it all again? <laughs> I'm good at this. <laughs> and I, I just got right into it so much and started playing. So thanks to Andy for getting me to play again. Do you know what I mean? The only thing is, it's a stupid illness you and I have got, you know? Did you pass it to me? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> And it, 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 it was a massive <coughs> transformation, you know, massive. Odd thing was, I didn't feel that I had to think about anything anymore. All I had to do was play the damn songs, and people loved it, and it was great, and I got drunk, and here we are. Thanks. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah. all the time, <laughs> all the time. I mean, only just recently, I've just been diagnosed with n another three cancers. And uh, my other half, she's a registered mental nurse. I always laugh when I first met her. I said, you were in witches in a bed, really. You weren't really in a nurse, were you? So we sort of blend together, don't we, Simone? <laughs> and uh, I, I was rushed in, and I was waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for treatments, and I was in absolute agony. I thought, how am I going to do this? But I just thought, I've got to. And it's exactly how I felt when I joined the dam. I've got to do it. If you want something, you've got to do it. Otherwise, you just go down. Just one question to you, Lee. Paul. Would you uh, listen to your organic brethren? <laughs> oh, without a doubt. Oh, without a doubt. Oh, I mean, who, who wouldn't? You know, it's, it's the best thing in the world. You know, you, you take the, the ups with the downs. It's life, isn't it? Yeah. But what better way to earn a living than, than to be in the dam? Well, you really? make money. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do, do you want my fiver? I'll try oh, to give you a fiver. Oh, then. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, the weird thing is being in a band, it, it kind of becomes normal, and it's such an unnormal life, mm. you know, it, because everything is, is totally surreal, everything's sort of arranged and done for you, you know, you kind of become mindless, you know, all you live for is the gig, and where's the bottle of whiskey in a dressing room, you know, and blah, 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 and it becomes like, natural you come home and you have to go to tesco's and get the shopping and that's unnatural you know it's really weird i mean it's, it's planet, odd it? to say yeah it's a you know <laughs> and i mean it's kind of one of the reasons that i moved from london to wales and i live out in a, a country a few miles off cardiff because it's kind of like it's it's another world and it kind of it, it grounded me and it was i was i i, I kind of quite like Often just being quite solitary and going out and wandering and noodling on the base, you know, and you know, I like sort of nature and all that and stuff. And chickens. I mean, chickens, they weren't in the film. My cat, Badger, my cat got a starring role, didn't he? <laughs> 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 um, uh, the chickens actually were in the film. Well, they are, they'll, they'll be well, in the extras in the DVD. And then, and then eventually I was just like, why do I have these chickens in the film? You know, they just, yeah. I was trying to make them work, you know. Yeah, I, well, we'll talk about doing a chicken documentary or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I w without a I'd, I'd do it all again. I wouldn't change a, a, a single thing. You know, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've been. I think I'm the luckiest person in the world to have the career I have as a bass player in three fantastic bands, and you know, the, all the other ancillary stuff is done with it. And it's, you know, it's a lot of it is luck. A lot of it's been in the right place and the right time. Um, you know, if it wasn't for this bloke, Dave Biggs and the Hot Rods, I'd have never got. I wouldn't be here today. Wouldn't be been in UFO or the damn the hot rods, you know. Somebody take the punt on a fifteen-year-old who never been in the band and could only play fast without really knowing it. You know, you just anything can kind of happen in life, and I'm just I'm incredibly lucky that 
the bits of you know my life sort of fell into place and I you know 25 years I didn't really have a day off without playing my bass you know with, with someone or other I do it I do it all again I do it all again 10 times over you know um, the, the future is a bit weird because you kind of look you know I've got a, a son now he's 11 and I sort of tell him bits and he's totally bored I stop showing off dad <laughs> you know if I talk about Minecraft he's like really on it oh yeah that's you know so it's a funny old world, isn't it? Right. At the end of the day, nothing really matters. That you know, all, all the ups and downs, the bad stuff, doesn't really mean anything at the end of the day, which is maybe why. <coughs> You know, not a lot was said on the on the film. You know, you you harbour these niggles, and there's reasons for everything. We've all got our own reasons that things went, you know, pear shaped. But at the end of the day, it's all about living in it. And you know, as Rat said, it's about surviving. You know, it, it's a great group to be in, but it's not. You know, you don't keep the world going round. We've got time for one last question, <coughs> and it's going to go to a lady up the back here who's been waiting very patiently, apparently. So. Oh, <laughs> oh hi. Um. I just wanted to agree with the guy down the front there that Strawberries was just a fantastic record and a fantastic tour. I mean, who's going to forget The Nuns? I was, I was lucky to be on that tour because uh, I was working for A&M Records at the time. So I was, you know, doing press for Captain. But um, I just wondered if maybe that the lack of success that The Damned had in commercial terms was maybe just like really bad timing because the unpredictability of the band would probably have not have endeared them too much to big record company deals. And I'm not really surprised that Simon Cowell didn't sign you. Um, but the, the Strawberries album was 1981, I think, around that time. 82. It did, and it was that time when things were going a bit synth pop, weren't they? So all the old punks, all the people that had been kind of inspired by the punk ethic were getting into like you know synthesizers and stuff. And maybe you just missed the opportunity at that time. I just wondered if you felt that it was a, just a question of bad timing. Was that to me? Sorry, Anybody I, that I'm a bit is in deaf, the band, I couldn't really hear the first bit. Was it about strawberries? Mm. Yeah, well, it was about strawberries and about that was a good, I thought that was a great commercial album. Mm. And I thought it was really pop and there was a lot of money put into it. I mean, you know, you had like the, the sleeve that you scratched and it smelled of strawberries. There was a lot of airplay. There was a big tour. And I think that that was a, a time when it could have been really capitalized on uh, in terms of commercial success. I and think it's it because the record companies don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, w w I think whatever damned you know, incarnation has been. No one has set out to write an album of a type. Mm -hmm. It's whatever we all came up with, whoever's been the damned at the time. And there's been incredible synergy in the damned. And certainly the, th the three main years I was with the damned before the reunion stuff, you know, 82, 83. It was extraordinarily creative. And we just, we were all writing reams and reams of stuff chucking cassettes in a post to each other of stuff we'd done on our four track four studios. You know, we probably had 70, 80 tracks for the Black Album and for Strawberries. A lot of it was half finished. But there were some great ideas there. And it just worked. Why did it work? I don't know. It, but it just did. Every now and again, you get a bunch of people, you know, it's like kind of live at Leeds, isn't it? Who? I mean, you know, to me, there's no album maybe the MC5, but live at least, it, it's just of its time, it really works. And I think we all just kind of, everybody was firing all six. We all were thinking along similar lines. And Strawberries kind of just happened as um, really a kind of a, not as a follow-up to the Black Album, but there was different instruments. We went back to Rockfield again. And the first thing the engineer said to you, Jones, was don't, don't expect it to be like last time. It won't be the same. And boy, it wasn't. But, you know, you don't know that until you get stuck into it. All sorts of crap happened. But a lot of the time, the crap makes the creative stuff happen. Um, and often the, the, the fighting creates sparks that you wouldn't have had before. And it, it just it just works sometimes. And Strawberries, I think, there was, there was a lot of commercial stuff and it's quite poppy. But, you know, Cats and I used to listen to ABBA. You know, we listened to lots of sick stuff, the monkeys and all that. And, and Vanian was very much a melodic person as well. Um, and 
everything just sort of fitted together. And that's just how it turned out. If we'd have gone to the studio maybe six months later, it would have probably been a totally different album. You know, it's just, some things you just can't explain, they just happen. And, you know, I'm just, for one, I'm just thankful that album happened. I think, I think it's really important as well that they, <coughs> the, you know, their contemporaries, as in, you know, the, the, the Pistols and The Clash, if you look at the bodies of work, across those three bands, you know, the, the body of work that, like, the <coughs> band did in all its, in, in all its sort of glory and different lineups and, and everything, um, is, you know, in, it, it doesn't help in terms of how people have been paid or recognised for it, um, but as a body of work, it's an amazing body of work that really goes right through, and maybe, you know, it takes a brave person like Wes to come along and make a film and go, actually, look at these guys. They're really important, all of them. You know, maybe that's what's going to make it happen. That seems like a perfect moment to finish up. So I'm sorry that we have to cut it uh, short. We could talk all night, but we're going to get kicked out of here imminently. I believe the bar is still open, and I'm sure these really? four guys are going to be out drink. there in a minute. <laughs> okay. So, but um, if we could just mm. please uh, thank these guys again for everything. Buy t-shirts. <laughs> if you don't buy t-shirts, Wes can't get the plane home.